It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here, and I think it's an incredibly important initiative that's happening. When Peter asked me to talk on this topic, when you talk about censorship, of course censorship is put to use to maintain a certain story in society that serves certain interests. And so when we took up, talk about corruption in psychiatry, we're often thinking about the corruption that results from pharmaceutical interests, uh, giving money to thought leaders, psychiatrists, that sort of thing. I think there's even a bigger source of uh, corruption, and that is that the institution of psychiatry protects its interests as a guild, as an organization. And so really three quick examples of the censorship that helps maintain the story that serves their interests, keeps public uh, belief in the you know, medications at a certain level, that sort of thing. First is, uh, very simply, there's a long history of basically ousting the critics. And it can be either that their uh, academic careers begin to languish, they have trouble getting funding, or sometimes they're just pushed out of the tribe. This meeting begins with Peter Gucci's uh, basically expulsion. Uh, but there's a long history of this. Lauren Mosher was head of schizophrenia studies in the, at the National Institute of Mental Health in the 1970s. He ran an experiment called the Satiria uh, Project. Very quickly, it was an experiment where people coming into an emergency room with uh, mostly a first episode of psychosis were either treated conventionally in the hospital with drugs and hospital care, or they were sent to a house that was just staffed by ordinary people. They made minimal use of antipsychotics, and the idea was the environment could be a way to uh, recovery. He began reporting his results. Results were at the end of six weeks, there was the same diminishment of psychotic symptoms, the target, in this group as in the hospital group. And then as they looked at longer term outcomes, you were seeing better social functioning, uh, better, you know, getting back into real lives, that sort of thing, and even a greater diminishment of psychotic symptoms. So he began reporting this. What happened is his colleagues uh, accused him of fraud. He was removed from the project. There was an investigation. He was, the investigation found there was no fraud, of course, but it didn't matter. He was now labeled with that fraud. He was eventually pushed out as head of the schizophrenia studies at the NIMH. Now, this served as a big um, sort of alarm or warning bell in American psychiatry, because here was the top schizophrenia doctor in the country pushed out for running an experiment that challenged hospital care, regular use of antipsychotics, and by the way, he deprofessionalized it. By that I mean he was having ordinary people rather than professionals. So he gets pushed out, and there's a long history of this. Peter's gonna talk, Peter Bregan is gonna talk about all the attacks on him when he became a, a, such a vocal critic. There was an uh, attempt to take his license when he began talking publicly on TV about tardive dyskinesia, which is a type of brain disease caused by antipsychotics. Gretchen Lefevre Watson was a psychologist who did something so simple. She just did a survey of the number of kids in, I think it was North Carolina, who were getting diagnosed with ADHD. And she reported that there was this very high level of diagnosis in a certain area. Anyway, there was an anonymous complaint to her university that she had committed fraud. Her computers were seized. There was like a two-year investigation. She was cleared, but her academic career by this time was over. She left. Uh, David Healy, you probably all know about. He's a, uh, an Irish psychiatrist who works in Wales, became very prominent in, in, in the world of psychiatry. He began criticizing antidepressants, uh, noting some evidence that they increase the risk of suicidal behaviors. He gets a job at the University of Toronto. He goes, delivers a, sort of an introductory lecture while he's waiting for his visa. He raises questions in that lecture about antidepressants, their efficacy, that they can cause suicide. And by the time he goes back to uh, Wales, the job offer has been rescinded. And it wasn't, what, if you really look at it, pharmaceutical companies gave a lot of money to the University of Toronto Psychiatric Department, and it was the University of Toronto that yanked his uh, job offer away. And we all know about Peter, uh, Peter Gucci. In a way, it seems like the trigger was his work on the uh, HPV vaccine story. My own opinion is he got into real hot water with the Cochrane collaboration when he began a wholesale criticism of psychiatry. And he wrote a paper called 10 Myths About Psychiatry that basically said this whole story, society is organizing itself around a story that is fraudulent. 
Now that's really an arrow to the heart of psychiatry, saying you've told us a false story. And I think this, his criticisms of psychiatry were a big reason he eventually got balanced. So that's one form of censorship. You just make it difficult to be a critic, and even if you stay in, you have trouble getting funding, that sort of thing. The second way of censorship is that the journals, the mainstream journals, the most high-impact journals, have editors that basically serve as gatekeepers. And you'll see through the peer review process that critical papers have a very difficult or impossible time of getting published in the mainstream journals. So what I did just for this thing is look at two topics that obviously are a public health concern and see where those papers were published. One topic is this, do antidepressants worsen long-term outcomes? Now, this is actually a thread in the, liter in the profession that goes back to the 70s. People saying, wow, I use antidepressants, maybe they get better a little faster, but it seems like they're relapsing back into depression more frequently, okay? It, are the drugs causing a chronification of the disorder? Now, given the use of antidepressants, and the fact that so many people start ending up, that go on them, end up on them long term, this is obviously a big public health concern, right? Okay, that's one. The second thing that has come up, and this has bubbled up from, uh, in essence, users' experiences, is a lot of people who have been on antidepressants for a longer time, they come off and they do not get their sexual function back. And it's called PSSD, post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. Now that's another really big public health concern. By the way, it seems particularly prevalent for people who are put on the antidepressants as teenagers. A huge, you know, worry you would think. Okay, these are the, on high impact psychiatric journals, these are the top five, okay? High impact meaning most often cited, that sort of thing. And so I just trace, first of all, the articles, the mainstream articles that you can find in the literature that talk about the evidence regarding do antidepressants worsen the long-term course of depression. Now you'll see that there's a guy named Giovanni Fava in Italy that really has been at the forefront of this discussion and he started his own journal, Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics, in essence to make it a home for uh, uh, you know, articles that did critique uh, mainstream psychiatry. But look at where they all got published. Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics, CNS Drugs, there are a couple of journals, uh, Clinical Psychiatry, Medical Hypotheses. By the way, this guy, Reef El Malik, used to work for Eli Lilly, the manufacturer of Zyprexa. You see this last one uh, in 2018? This is a long-term prospective study. One of the authors is one of the leading mood disorder experts in the world. Um, he's from Switzerland, and again, it wasn't published in one of the big five. So, in addition to not finding any of these articles in the Big Five, I then went to the journals, searched their data. Uh, some people are naming this uh, condition tardive dysphoria. In other words, it's a dysphoric state that happens later on. So I went to the journals. I didn't find any articles published there. And then I looked to see, could I find any mention in these journals through a search function of tardive dysphoria or any concern about antidepressants, worsening the long-term course of depression. I couldn't find a single mention. This is in 25 years. And you can see the problem. No, why would they not want to mention this? Because if you start talking about research showing that you may be causing an increased uh, chronicity of depression, that's going to be a real problem for your product of antidepressants and the story you tell about a brain disease and the very effective drugs. It, it, it will threaten your whole story you're telling to the public. How about PSSD? This really started rising in internet forums in the early years of the 2000s after people had been on the SSRIs. It doesn't seem to happen with the tricyclics, but it's the SSRI antidepressants. Look at the journals where this has appeared. You get, you know, journals on sex marital therapy. Again, psychotherapy and psychosomatics has been a real home for this. You also have the International Journal of Risk and Safety Medicine. That is a place that you do see articles about harms from uh, drugs, uh, treatments, etc. Do you see any of the big five? I did a, um, a magazine story. I got a commission to do a magazine story on this. This was in 2011. Uh, magazine says, what do you want to write about? I said, I want to write about PSSD. And I said, but I've seen your magazine, you're not going to print it. 
because the magazine is funded with a lot of uh, ads. And the guy goes, oh, no, no. We have a, a wall between publishing and editorial. We'll, we'll publish it. So I did the article, and he goes, we can't publish this. <laughs> and, and by the way, I interviewed many, many people who went on these antidepressants, came off, and they did not get their sexual function back, but it's not just sexual function. They just didn't care about life so much. They say, oh, I see a beautiful rainbow, I don't care. I hear a great song, I don't care. Um, I see a beautiful woman or a, a beautiful man, I don't care. So there was this extraordinary sense of loss related to going on an antidepressant. And where is it in the mainstream literature? Here's the number of articles. And same thing, I searched. Is there any talk, is there any discussion in these journals about this problem? These are the, these are the high impact journals that are cited in evidence-based medicine, where you get your clinical practice guidelines, textbooks from it, you don't see it. And so what you see in here is a censorship of a concern arising actually from, of course, research that's kept out of the public dialogue. And you can see why, because if this gets mentioned as well, you really have to rethink the use of, of, of antidepressants um, in the sort of willy-nilly way we do today. Oh, you have a little problem, go on an antidepressant. But if you had this lurking, you'd be much more cautious. Then finally, I just want to look at how with major government-funded studies, when they didn't get results they wanted, they hid those bad results. Those results that, again, that um, questioned that narrative that, uh, of, of meds that fix problems in the brain, that we have organized our societies around, that conventional narrative. Now, the first study was called the MTA study. It started in the early 1990s. It was funded by the NIMH. And when they funded this study, here's what they said. We've been giving kids stimulants now for 15 years, and we have no evidence that it provides any long-term benefit to the kids on any domain of functioning. Academic achievement, delinquency rates, anything. And the NIMH said, this is the first good clinical study of ADHD and long-term outcomes, okay? This is going to guide our thinking. So, and the way it had this, these arms, it, uh, you were either randomized to a uh, drug prescribed by an expert in ADHD, drug prescribed by someone in the community, behavioral therapy, or behavioral therapy plus um, drug. So there was no placebo control because they said that would be unethical. Anyway, at the end of 14 months, you can see carefully crafted medication management, meaning the group of experts, that group had lower ADHD symptoms, and there was a sign those kids were doing better in reading. And now this is the conclusion. Since ADHD is now regarded by most experts as a chronic disorder, ongoing treatment often seems necessary. This becomes the evidence you're going to see cited for keeping kids on stimulants, all right? Now this study continues. Now as it continues, it's, it's really a naturalistic study. People are free to go off drugs or on drugs, and they're just going to be measuring what is happening to those who stay on drugs or go on drugs long-term versus those who do not? Now, in the abstract at three months, it says, hey, listen, this benefit we saw at 14 weeks has disappeared. 14 months. That's what it says in the abstract. It's disappeared. They're no longer better. Now, if you read the study really carefully, you find that at the end of three years, being on medication was a significant marker, not of beneficial outcome, but of deterioration. In other words, the kids on meds are doing worse as we go out further in time. It's in there, but it's buried. It's not in the abstract, it's not in the conclusion. You gotta read this study really carefully. There's one line. Six years, no significant differences between the medicated use and the unmedicated use. What do you do if, you, what do you see if you read it real carefully and look at a data table? Medication use was associated with worse hyperactivity, impulsivity, and oppositional defiant disorder symptoms, and with greater overall functional impairment. So there's this abstract that people read, and then there's a, it's there, but you got to read it real closely, and it's the abstract so often that guide, guide thinking. And what do you hear today? If you're a parent, your kid gets diagnosed with ADHD, do you want your kid on these drugs long term? The, journal, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry says, we have evidence that provides a long term benefit, and what do they cite? The 14 month results. They don't cite the three year results, they don't cite the six year results.
So what you see here is a selective sort of presentation of evidence and hiding the bad data. Okay, next one, the TAD study. These are all government funded, so these are not funded by the pharmaceutical companies, although the investigators usually have been consultants to the pharmaceutical companies. The TAD study is the treatment of adolescent depression study. Now, as you probably all remember, when the antidepressants were tested in adolescents, they mostly were not effective, even over the short term. And there was a risk of increased risk of suicidal ideation, suicidal events. The FDA put a black label, a black box warning label on the antidepressant and said, it looks like it doubles the risk of suicidal events. Then we get this study. And what they said is, you see, they're randomized to placebo, to CBT, or Prozac plus CBT, okay? So, uh, so you get placebo, drug, CBT, or, 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 and drug plus CBT. And you look here, those randomized to uh, placebo, you see uh, nine suicidal attempts. Those randomized to fluoxetine or fluoxetine plus CBT, nine events. So they say, there is no evidence of medication-induced behavioral activization as a precursor to a suicidal event. The idea was that the drugs could activate kids and they would cause a suicidal event. What are the real results? It was a, it was a Swedish um, psychiatrist who actually pointed this out. He sent an email to me. If you read the study really carefully, what happened was this. After 12 weeks, many of the uh, people randomized to placebo or CBT alone were asked to go on drug, okay? And what you really see is if this is suicidal events by drug exposure. So if you were randomized to placebo, but, and then you were put on drug and had a suicidal attempt, this is my chart, what we were seeing was the suicidal events were coming in people randomized to placebo or CBT, but then were switched to drug, and it only happened after they were switched to drug. So if you do this by drug exposure, you see that 17 of 18 suicide attempts were on, were on uh, kids on drug. That's very different than no evidence of a precur that the, the drug can cause this activation of a suicidal event. Now, what's amazing on this, the Swedish guy pointed this out to me, Goran Holberg, it's actually in there. There's a chart that shows when the people in the placebo group had a, a suicidal event, and if they were exposed to drug, they colored it in. So all you had to do was uh, count the colored circles. But if they were honest, <laughs> They would say 17 of 18 suicidal events were in fact were on people on drug, rather than say there was no evidence of any problem. Now I know uh, mothers who've lost children to suicide because Prozac was given a clean bill of health and not causing suicide related to this. Finally, uh, the NIMH uh, conducted the largest and longest antidepressant study ever. It was called the STAR-D study. If you go back, they said, this is going to guide our, our thinking about antidepressants and how effective they are. Because they said those industry-funded trials are not conducted in a, a representative sample of real-world patients. They have all sorts of exclusion criteria. This was going to show what happens to patients in real-world clinical care. They come into the study, they would be given a drug. If the first drug didn't work, they'd go through a second round of treatment that might be drug plus psychotherapy. And if that didn't work, they'd get a third try, and then they would get a fourth try, okay? And the idea was, we keep trying, we'll find something that works, and you'll see this. Given the dearth of controlled data, results should have substantial public health and scientific significance since they are obtained in representative participant group settings using clinical management tools that can easily be applied in daily practice. This is going to govern our thinking. Here's what was announced. Remission rate 67%. NIMH put out a press release. Over the course of all four levels, almost 70% of those who didn't withdraw from the study became symptom-free. And now the New Yorker, which is a magazine that does fact-checking, said there was a 67% effectiveness rate. And this became the story. Yeah, maybe the first antidepressant worked, but you can change it, and eventually you'll find one that works. Now, what's the real data? A guy named Ed Pickett w got through a Freedom of Information request. He managed to get the uh, protocol, and he began to look at all the ways they deviated from the protocol. They, they actually counted people who were admitted who had no baseline score, 
or had a baseline score which showed that they weren't depressed enough to be even eligible for the trial. They switched outcome measures from HAMD, which was the one they were supposed to use, to this quid score. And what they did is they played around with the numerator and the denominator, and they kept doing changes away from the protocol that upped the people who could be seen as remitted. Uh, and if necessary, they, they dropped the denominator. And then they said, and the people who dropped out, if they had just stayed in, they would have remitted at the same rate that those who did stay in, and they calculated this fake rate of 67%. Now there's been someone who got patient data. They're down to 26% of patients who actually remitted in the first episode. 67 down to 26. Now here's the one-year results. Those who remitted were whisked away into a follow-up trial, and the idea was now we're going to show we can keep these people well. They could change the drugs. They were paid to stay in the trial. Out of 4,041 patients who entered the trial, at the end, only 108 were still well and in the trial. That's a stay well rate of 3%. Now this data, by the way, there is a table, and when they report the one-year results, that if you could make sense of the table, shows this result. I could not make sense of the table. I did not know anyone who could make sense of the table. Ed Piggott finally did. And then he went to the lead investigator and he said, is it possible that your table is saying that only 108 out of 4,000 were well at the end of one year? The investigator was a guy named Mauricio Fava, who was Giovanni Fava's brother. And Mauricio Fava said, it's always good when someone else gets a look at your data. Yes, I don't, uh, I don't dispute that. Anyway, that's it. What you see here real quickly is how again and again, those in, in power, in positions of authority, uh, present information in a way that protects guild interests. And they keep out all this information that the public needs to know from a public health uh, you know, perspective. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Bob, you mentioned that there, um, you know, there are problems with trials that aren't published and then when they are published, they, they go through this peer review pro process and there's these sort of glaring um, missteps. Do you think, I'd like to hear your comments on, you know, whether you think it's problems with the peer review process or is it the editors of journals that want to avoid controversial topics? Yeah, I think it's both. So you have editors of journals, of these major journals that are psychiatrists, that are part of, uh, you know, the power structure within the institution of psychiatry. So they're often hostile towards, you know, a, a finding that antidepressants worsen the long-term course of depression. And then there's a peer review process. And the peer review process, you can figure out who you're gonna send the articles to, and they're gonna be hostile to uh, findings like this. There's a guy named Jay Amsterdam, who is one of the, he was a biological guy in American psychiatry. Uh, going back to the 1980s, he eventually became a whistleblower. But he also has data from a long-term study showing that actually there's an increased chronicity, increased relapses associated with exposure to antidepressants. He's, hard, he's having an impossible time right now to get this published. So yeah, I think that the peer review process, rather than being a process that you know, filters out the good from the bad, is done in a way that protects the interests of that guild that actually runs those journals. Uh, and that's what you see in the fact that they haven't even addressed these two issues around antidepressants. 25 years and you cannot find in the five leading psychiatric journals a mention of these uh, uh, health concerns. I, I remember when I was doing um, research into antidepressants and I came across the STARD trial, a lot of psychiatrists were actually using it as support for prescribing antidepressants. Why do you think the, the media didn't take this up? Yeah, that's a good question. This, I, was in, I was playing tennis one day, just real quickly, and I was in the you know, shower area and there's two doctors there, and one goes to us, thank God we finally have evidence that our drugs work. Talking about the STARD trial, 70% <laughs> cure. And I felt going, well, really, not really, but anyway. Um, the media has, uh, the, the, has its own filter. And if you're reporting for a mainstream organization, you can't, it, you can't re it's really hard to 
uh, say, well, listen, the study study is fake. Because you're going to be asked to go to the very people who did the study, <laughs> and they're going to defend it. So, and then I can remember the first time I quoted Peter Bregan in a story uh, for the Boston Globe. The, the Globe better said, ah, but Peter Bregan, yeah. You know, he's, a, he's, he's, he's this crazy ide ideal, ideological guy. So you have this pressure of editors that have a hard time contradicting conventional belief systems. Jumping forward in time, but now we've got a clutch of papers, particularly in the vaccine area, that have been published and then retracted. And in that case, obviously, the peer process, peer review process went on fine, but presumably editors got lent on in a more blatant way. Let's just look at the STAR-D study. Uh, there are two things are happening. If you look at where the initial results were published, I actually had a slide on this, but I was getting booted from the stage. Um, they were all in mainstream. The fraudulent things were published in mainstream high-impact journals. The deconstruction articles were published in like psychotherapy and psychosomatics. Now they have called for a retraction of all these other things, but they're just not getting any traction. However, they now finally are getting access to patient level data and they've called for a reanalysis uh, that just appeared the other day. Now that has a chance, I think, if you get a group and they're, they're gathering together some prominent investigators, if they can go through the patient level data, we saw the first part that said only 25% actually remitted by the protocol, but they're also looking at, there were all these secondary outcomes that were supposed to be published, weren't published. I think that may, eventually really lead to a, uh, perhaps a retraction effort of the STAR-D study. But the problem is those studies were published like in 2006. Here we are, 2019. It took so much time basically to use freedom of information requests, uh, to get the protocol and all this. So the damage has been done, but that may happen through this, R, you know, the RAIT uh, process. They've now put a call out for that as well. Just hit, hit BMJ like the other day. I gotta be out of here. <laughs>